Hello to all my people, and if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Welcome to another episode of Botch Pots and Chair Shots. I'm your host, a chef by trade and a mark by choice. I am the Will Gray, and joining me tonight, he is the Lucha Brutal Come and Take It champion. He is the Texas All-Star Pro Wrestling Heavyweight Champion. He is Mr. 5K, Nate Bradley. Nate, how are you, brother? Thanks for coming on Chat Out Some Wrestling with me, man. What's up? I'm doing just fine. You doing all right? So far, so good. Like I was saying, Thursdays are usually kind of easy for me. And uh, this is the last stop of the day. So we're going to hang out, talk about wrestling for the next little bit. And then probably going to go get like some Captain D's and watch TNA or something. Just a, an easy Thursday. Sweet. Sounds good. Sweet. So this is like I was saying right before we hit the go button. Super easy. Um, but kind of everybody. MCU does them. DC does it everybody has an origin story all right so pro wrestlers have to have one you don't just wake up one day and become a pro wrestler there's training and a process and everything so what was that like for you when you decided okay i want to be a pro wrestler what was that initial process like of figuring out how to go about that all right well uh let me take it back just a little bit further as to what actually pushed me to going for it and it was when you know i was still in college at the time and um I just felt like I, I just didn't have like any direction, I guess. And I was looking and, you know, everyone always says, go after your dreams, do do what's going to make you happy. Not what's going to make the most money. Granted, pro wrestling can make people money. Right. But that's not that's not the reason to get into it. And I, I was I was kind of at a loss getting pulled as far as like, what do I really, really want to do? You know, and and pro wrestling is one of those things that it's it does have a timer on it. Because unlike a lot of other occupations, I guess you could say, you really can't jump into that that later in life. There's a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, you need to get in early so that your prime years are there. It's not something that you can just pick up whenever, you know. So I, I was kind of, you know, entertaining the idea and what really, really the kind of catalyst is kind of funny is I was just kind of down in my head, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wanted to wrestle, but I just didn't think it was, you know, it didn't seem like it was it was feasible or like I was being real. And and I was eating Chinese food one day, and one of the fortune cookies said, uh, no man is a failure as long as he's enjoying his life. And for some reason, that really resonated with me. And I, I had messaged a close friend of mine who, I'm always watching uh, wrestling with and we're always playing games together. You know, and I, I told him, I said, hey, man, like I'm going for it. Like I'm really, really going for it. I said, I'm not sure when I'm going to I'm going to try as soon as I can. You know, and he said, he said, dude, just get your foot in the door like right now. You don't have to dive head first, but just get something going. I said, all right, I will. So that night I started looking around for pro wrestling schools. I was living uh, close to New Orleans at the time. And so Wildcat Sports was the, uh, that's the, definitely the biggest in Louisiana, the primary pro wrestling, uh, indie, indie, uh, school and promotion. And, uh, I had messaged them and Luke Cox is the, you know, or he was the owner at, at the time. And he had responded, um, and said, yeah, you know, cause I, I messaged him just like, Hey, I wanted to come in. I wanted to check it out. Like I want to get into pro wrestling. And he said, why don't you come check it out? Come by tomorrow at like six. And so I did, and I didn't realize this at the time, but a lot of pro wrestling schools, they're okay with just taking your cash, waving you in, letting you just go through the motions. And then sometimes they'll just push you and push you out. Some will just keep you there forever, whatever. But with Luke, he does, he's, he, he took pride in what comes in and comes out. So the initial meeting with him, I didn't know it at the time, but it was essentially an interview. Like, do I want you at my school? Are you in it for the right reason? Is your head in the game? You know, and so it was just kind of like a personality test. And we were just kind of chit-chatting for like 30 minutes to an hour, kind of like what we're about to do, right? But like it it was him getting a feel for me. Like, is this kid going to take this serious or is this about to be another waste of my time? Because that happens at every school ever. And that's that's just – that's every industry ever, of course. But Luke's a very, you know, it needs to be worth my time type thing. And so the same way I invest in paying for my tuition to learn how to, you know, perform, he's investing in me as a human being, his time and energy, you know, is it going to be worth the headache of, you know, taking me from ground and 
building me into something that can go out there and actually do stuff. So that was kind of how it all got started. So October 2016 was my first official day at Wildcat Sports. So when you got into the school, first and foremost, though, New, or New Orleans, one of my favorite cities on the planet, not named Nashville. Spent some time down there in my culinary career. Absolutely love this city. Um, when you got into the the school, though, and you were there, a lot of people say that certain aspects kind of were eye opening or shocking, you know, like culture shock. Was it the schedule? Was it the bumps? Was it the physicality of getting in the ring? Uh, what would you say was the most eye opening part of being in training? The most eye opening part, I think, is is how humane it is, or I guess when the lights and camera are turned off, how it's, it's very day to day. I mean, from my first month there, the first show that they did was just a few weeks later and I was picking up Teddy long at the airport. And, you know, it's just like, these aren't, they're humans like you, you know, and it's weird when you're just sitting and just talking to now it's nothing. It's been years now, but that was the first initial, like, you don't have to be like, so in awe, like they're this, they're just the same dudes as you that got into the same thing as you. They did the same thing as you, and they're still doing the same thing as you, you know. And so that was definitely the biggest was just realizing we're really on equal playing field across the bar. We really are. Some have more success and some put more effort in than others. That's true. But at the end of the day, we're all human beings that got into the exact same industry to do the exact same thing. And so you're running around, you're meeting all these guys that you saw on TV and you just realize they're just, they're just another dude, just like you. And you, you're not even talking wrestling half the time. You know what I mean? It's, that was probably the most eye opening aspect of getting into it. One of the things that I, I've found fascinating the most is the relationships that a lot of times you guys build in the business, because like you just said, it's a very humane on, on that side of the curtain. It's a very humane way of going about things. Like it's, it's a lot, you know, people use the term family a lot in the locker room and stuff like that. Um, how important to a young Nate were those relationships that you were developing, having a chance to pick up, you know, along at the airport and be in the car with him and pick his brain and stuff. Even if you're not talking about wrestling, talking about life, how important were those relationships? I think, uh, I think, and you know, and not every interaction was like that. Right. And I'm not going to name names because I don't I don't want any of that drama. But, you know, there were some that I met that had very successful careers and WWE and impact and whatnot and that were absolute pricks when you talk to them way worse than you could have imagined them being, you know. So at the end of the day, it really is just you don't know who's behind what's portrayed on TV, you know. Um, but I think. I'd rank that pretty high as far as importance because it kind of going back to what I just said, it shows that they really are just another person like you. And at the end of the day, it's just how well does so-and-so perform their job. And granted, nowadays it's a little different because nowadays if you're an absolute prick, you will get kicked out of the locker room, which I think is an acceptable, I like I'm all about that being like a modern thing, you know, a little bit more of like a controlled environment, but it, it's it's also kind of interesting to see like you can't be fooled by what you're looking at on camera because as soon as the lights are off of them, they might be so sweet or they might be an absolute just total ass. And you just you never know. You never know. And so I think that was really cool to me because it 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 kept me on my guard in a way, I guess. It it, it made it to where you you understood that you should not make any presumptuous just assumptions of anyone upon first meeting you really need to hang around them for a little while you know so as you get into your career a little bit when i was going through doing my due diligence turning my rocks over i saw early in your career you got the call to be on raw um it was it's always a, an interesting experience when you know, I'll, I'll say an independent guy without meaning a slight, but when you get called up to raw, you're going up there to do a job. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Uh, what was, what was that experience like for you getting the call, having a chance to be so young in your career and still being able to be on, you know, the biggest wrestling show in the world. I, I would say, first of all, um, I'm going to do my thank yous real quick in case he does listen to this, but, uh, it was all Luke, Luke Hawks did it. And, um, just kind of like a long story short on how that, came to be um 
it's not like he's twisting anyone's arms. If they didn't want to use me, they wouldn't have, right? But the way that that worked was Luke, he really does always try to get his guys that he sees are putting the effort in. Um, he tries to get them stuff, even if it's something minute, he tries. And so the thing with uh, Louisiana is Louisiana is one of the states that actually does have an athletic commission. And so in order to actually have a professional wrestling like like company like running there, you have to have a pro wrestling license. And WWE does not keep up with a Louisiana license when they're only in Louisiana two or three times a year. You know, that doesn't mean anything to them to pay and have all those fees associated. So, um, and if I'm wrong about what I'm saying right now, I do apologize, but I'm like 99% sure what I'm saying right now is, is accurate as far as, so Luke had a good working relationship with WWE. Whenever they came in town, he let them use his license. So they didn't have to pay all those extra fees and all that. And in exchange, you have any guys that we can throw a bone? And so that was how I got that opportunity. So when you're you're coming up and you're at that point in your career, you have a match. It's a match. Pretty mm -hmm. much every day when you walk in, you do the same job. It's what you do. Mm -hmm. But there is a huge difference between doing that for a TV taping and doing that at a standard house show. Um, sure. Early in your career versus where you're at now, what are some of the biggest differences when you go into a TV taping or if you're planning a match for a house show? Well, are you talking about like the differences between a TV and a house show or just me nowadays versus me in the past? Uh, let's go with you nowadays versus how you would look at it in the past. Like when you're getting ready, if you know, okay, I'm doing a TV taping, we're sure. going to go in, this is what we're going to do. Is there a difference in planning, I guess is what I'm saying, versus okay. a house show and your approach to it now versus then? Sure. So, um, you know, I actually, I treat them as one and the same because my performance, I, I don't believe that there's any reason for me to put a different amount of effort based on TV or house or 10 people in the crowd. Or when I do get lucky and I get those arenas and there's a thousand or more, you know, like, uh, like I, there's no reason for me to do anything different because it's not organic when it's not. And I know some people phone it in. That's never been me. And that's, you know, we'll see in the next 12, 13 years, how I feel, you know, but as of now and all of the years leading up till now, I've never done anything ever than anything less than like, what is the best I can do right here and right now? Because I, I want people to see me and I only want to watch what I would want to watch. And so what I mean is it, when people are in the crowd, I think, what do they like to watch? What is the wrestling they want? And there's a different style and whatever for everyone. But I think about what I enjoyed when I was just a fan. And I certainly wouldn't enjoy someone kind of half-assing it because it was a house show. You know, that, that would take away every and all purpose of it. So that's kind of my little differential there is that I really don't treat them differently. Um, now, as far as me now versus me some years back, well, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I really didn't. I mean, even two, three years in, you have no freaking idea what's going on. You just don't. And anyone that thinks they do listen to me, you don't because <laughs> every year it's like a whole nother world, you know? And, and I know that 10 years from now, it's going to be e even more night and day. Something that Luke used to say is uh, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. And that doesn't make sense out loud. Cause that sounds so obvious. Like, obviously I don't know, but it's just like what he's really getting at is like these experiences that you have, you couldn't even have someone explain them to you with the best of detail and you comprehend until it's happened. You know, those on the road stories, those crazy encounters, those weird experiences, those backstage experiences, fights, friendships, all that like in the industry are so it's so odd and nuanced and different. You, you would just never be able to comprehend until you've gone through it. And so now when I walk into like, cause I did, you know, I'm sure I know we're going to kind of touch up on this more later, but uh, I did the NWA taping at the end of uh, 2022. I didn't treat it any different than how I treat my, my indie matches. And guess what? It was extraordinarily well received because I did exactly what I always do. And, but the thing is going into it, I wasn't like nervous. There's always pre-match nerves, but I was not nervous. I was because I knew what I was going to do. It doesn't matter if I fumble a thousand times in a match, it will still be a good match. And that's the mindset everyone needs to go into so that they're not stressing about, oh my God, what if this part goes wrong? Well, who cares? You got 99% of the other match. Stop worrying about what could go wrong. Think about what could go right, you know? And so I go into that, I go into every match like that. And, and it's way more fun that way. 
and you shouldn't be doing it if you aren't having fun. It needs to be taken seriously. But if you don't enjoy it, what's the point? You know, when I was that young and that early into my career and I got the um, the the WWE match, I had no clue what I was doing. You know what I mean? I just had not been through enough to understand. I didn't understand what I should say. I didn't understand what I should do. I didn't understand how to exude anything, how to make little things mine. If you give me one thing to do nowadays in a match, I will make it very unique to me. I couldn't have, I couldn't have understood how to do that then. You know, it doesn't matter if they spoon fed me exactly what to do. It wouldn't have really been me. Now, no matter what you throw at me, I will make it mine and it will, it will make sense. Everyone will go, yeah, that's what Nate does. But at the time, it just, it wasn't there yet. You know, it takes a while. It's not something you consciously think of. It's something that just gradually you start to comprehend it as like second nature, you know? Sorry, it's kind of long winded. <laughs> There's no such thing as a long-winded answer on this show, bud. Um, one of my favorite analogies I've ever heard in doing these interviews is wrestlers will take something from their normal day life and turn it up to 11. Um, you just said it there. You, you'll take a moment and you'll make it unique to you. Mm -hmm. What are you turning up to 11 from your everyday life to make something unique in the ring about you? Personality-wise, it could be the way you carry yourself, the way you talk, anything. What are you turning up to 11? It's almost like, this is kind of hard to put into words. I'm going to do the best I can, but it's almost like excitement and sociability. Like when you're around people that you like being around, like you've got friends or family that you actually really enjoy their company and it immediately kind of boosts your mood. You know, it's like, oh, I'm seeing so-and-so today, so it can't be a bad day, you know, or like I haven't seen so-and-so in forever and it's, it's going to be a good day. I, that's kind of the, the feeling that I kind of latch onto and that's what I want to exude. And so you know, um, I, I've had many, many matches that I'm very fond of in the last few years, but they were all very different. But there's one constant that I enjoy that keeps me like really fired up, even if it wasn't like the coolest match I did or the most athletic. It never fails when I have that like moment and you feel that moment and you feel the crowd energy. And when you turn to them and you and you just kind of open to them like, Y'all saw that and they're like, yeah, we did. That is such an unexplainable feeling of you just connected with a bunch of strangers and you don't need to know anything about them other than you're all enjoying what's happening right now. And that's such a cool, you know, just being like being like a social butterfly, but for wrestling. So that's kind of the part that I guess gets turned up the most when it's uh, when it's go time. So get a couple years into your career now. Um, around that 2021 range, you had one of the busiest years in your career. Um, what's it been like figuring out how to do that work-life balance? Because a lot of guys, especially on the indies, you guys have work, then you have life, then you have your wrestling life. There's a lot of balls you're juggling there. Mm -hmm. How's the work-life balance these days? It's tricky. I mean, it really is. And I, I think, I think this is what I had to learn. This was something I learned really kind of recently, just like the last year or two, is you have to understand that it's going to keep changing. There's no such thing as like this set stagnant, like I've got it all figured out. If everything stays like this, we're good. It's really not like that because that's just, that's not real. Like scheduling conflicts, conflicts with shows, conflicts with work, conflicts with your personal life, it is going to happen for the rest of your freaking life. And it's okay that is just what life is. It doesn't work out perfectly. There's never going to be this perfect scenario where everything fell perfectly into place. You've got to look at all these guys that are outrageously successful. I mean, what's one of the biggest names we've got outside of wrestling that was from wrestling right now? Probably The Rock, right? Think about how many times he had to tell someone, yeah, I can't do that. I can't make that date. I can't make that movie taping. I can't, no, WWE, I can't come back for this because I got this going on. I got five movies. No, I got an appointment for this. I got the Under Armour thing. Like, you know, it's probably outrageously miserable, but if they care, they're willing to work with him. And so you just have to understand you have to make it work. And if they care, they'll make it work with you too. And you're going to have to move stuff time to time, but there's not going to be this perfect, like this week was perfect. And then next week was perfect. And then the next week was perfect. It's not every, every day it's going to be a little bit different. And that's just, if you get used to understanding that you're not going to have this perfect structure in your life, you'll be okay. And I know that sounds weird. That's chaotic for a lot of people, but 
for it's not just for professional wrestlers it's like entertainers in general you know like think about people that are in like rock bands uh, um any type of musician really uh, you know movie stars whatever like uh people that just work talk shows like it's they're not on some set they're hectic and they're always trying to make the next date because they got a 3 p.m this and a you know a, a 4 a.m this and it's just like it's crazy and that's just if you want to make it work you just kind of have to go roll with the punches and just do it. So, some of those wild uh, road trips and turnarounds that you guys have to do on the roads are are nuts. Do you have one particularly that comes to mind when when you when that comes up? Is like Jesus, I can't believe I pulled that shit off in one weekend, or you know, yeah. two shows in one day, or whatever the case may be. Do you have one right offhand that comes to mind? Yeah, I had one that. I got, well, I've really got two, but can I tell you both? That's okay. Uh, I got three. Can I do Absolutely. three? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Take as much time as you want, brother. It's you. <laughs> they're, all, they're all wild for different reasons, right? Um, one was in, it was in 2021, and it was when I was doing three or four shows a week, um, sometimes twice in a single day, right? That, I had one in particular that was pretty wild, and it was where I started in Houston, and the next night I went to Dallas and then the next day, Austin, which isn't too far, but then from the, but then the Austin show ran extremely late, like almost like midnight. And then I had to be in Laredo the next day for like an early show. So I was almost doing like eight straight hours from there straight into that show. And then I had to drive straight back to Houston for work that night. That was one of the craziest. Cause I was on almost two days of no sleep at work that day just like wired out of my mind that was a crazy one that was the that was the year where i was just picking up every freaking show i could and i was working three or four times a week um i got that out my system by the way uh, i think everyone does once you get to that point where you're able to do it and then you do it for a while and you're like oh god can i handle this for the rest of my life <laughs> it's like you gotta be a little more smart about what you're what you're doing you don't need to wrestle every single show that throws something at you and i, I think some people need to hear that because that's important you don't need to do every single show when you want to do it and you're younger like i get it you want to you want to just wrestle all the time but then you get to a point where you're like all right what am i getting out of this aside from being beat up the entire week and then going into the next show still hurt from previous weeks matches and then and then you're not ever healing and months go by and you feel like you're falling apart you need to reevaluate you're too young to feel like that you know what i mean wrestling's rough on your body it's going to wear you down over the years but you should not be like destroyed in like a five year time frame into the business. That's crazy, you know. Um second one, it's not too crazy, but it's it's a pretty big one. It was some years back. It was when I was in New Orleans. I was um there's another uh pro wrestler named uh Chuck Devine. Um he's worked in a couple other places and like like Mexico and whatnot, like uh TJ and, and whatnot. And um he uh he and I had gone from New Orleans to Oklahoma one night and then we went to Beaumont that next night well next day really so we had stayed in Oklahoma overnight um for just a few hours and we went to Beaumont the next day and then drove straight back to New Orleans and then both went into work that day that was kind of a crazy it was like what like 12 hours to Oklahoma then like eight to Beaumont then five back home or something but that was in like two days not three so that was that was also a pretty rough one and then there's one in particular that it's not too crazy, but I guess it's just kind of funny. It was when uh, myself and a whole bunch of the Wildcat guys and Luke included and all got like an 11 seater van, which was like something I would never do again because <laughs> I ended up in the worst spot ever. I was in the dead center in the middle row, which didn't have a headrest in the back. And I had someone to my left and to the right was actually the middle entrance to the van. So there was a gap there. So there wasn't a person on my right. So there was in the middle, I had the middle open. So there was nowhere for me to rest my head forward, back, left, or right. So I was like this for the whole 13, 14 hour trip. Horrible. Absolutely terrible. I drove for like three hours, which was better than sitting in the middle because there's just nothing I could rest on. I can't tell you how I got stuck there, but I did. And fun fact, because I didn't tell anyone this, um, or I told a select few people, that was for WrestleCade. And some people are going to laugh when they hear this. I'm telling you, they're going to be like, is he being serious? Matt Lancey was one of the trainers at Wildcat. He got hurt. And so he had to pull from his match. So they replaced him with me. So it was in uh, Winston-Salem. Was that like North South Carolina? And um, 
they replaced him with me. And that was for the uh, the AML show, which was like on Saturday, I believe, because Wrestle Cave is like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we went up there um, either Thursday or Friday, and we stayed till Sunday. But he got hurt. And this is the kicker. I have not been hurt a lot of times in, in wrestling. A few times. But he got hurt, so I replaced him. That night, the night before we left, something went really bad at practice. And I landed really funny. And I tore my rotator cuff in my right arm. And I couldn't move. My arm passed right about here. And I didn't say a word. And I did that trip. And I wrestled that match. And no one had any idea. But when that match was done, I couldn't move my right arm for like two weeks. It was fried because I just I threw all those clotheslines and everything in that match like nothing was wrong. And it was about an eight month healing process. But I almost lucked out because COVID happened right there. So I didn't even miss any wrestling shows. There were no wrestling shows. I got to just heal during COVID, which I know everyone's gonna be like, oh, look, he's making light of COVID. Yeah, I kind of am. I got lucky. <laughs> Everyone else was sitting out because they had to. I got lucky. Like, All right. And I came back fresh, you know? So, but that, that story was kind of amusing to me. Um, and then the night, the day we were supposed to return the van, um, we were 16 hours away from New Orleans. It was a 14 hour drive back. And we had to return it by 6 p.m. And we weren't going to make it, but Luke drove and we made it. And so that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty scary. That's pretty scary. <laughs> Racing the GPS kind of thing. Oh like it God. says it's going to take 12 hours. We're going to make it in 1115. <laughs> he managed to cut more than an hour off of a like a 16 hour drive or whatever the hell it was. It's so scary. <laughs> it's so scary. <laughs>